Well, welcome back this week, this Christmas week, uh, to this these constant contact videos um, as we've been addressing um, hard questions and hot topics. And I, I'm going to just do a relatively simple question today, but it was equally on the hard questions that was given to us. But I think it really applies um, to what we celebrate this Christmas season, and that just is around the question of does God love me um, and I think we can just go back to that John three sixteen that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son and that's kind of where my answer will revolve around but we can dig a little deeper into this question maybe uh, and that is everyone everywhere is looking for a deep uh love, an attachment love to be truly loved. And and as they look for that, they will try to earn that love or they will essentially reject that love or they will act as if they do not deserve that love. Um, I mean, the first, it, the people that try to earn the love is the story of the Pharisee or maybe an elder sibling where we do everything in our power, everything that is expected of us, everything that we can possibly do to receive some reward. And ultimately, we are hoping that we might receive some type of, an, of affection, of approval, and to be told, I love you because of what you did. The other story is one of maybe the sinner or the younger sibling who will live the adventurous life ever pushing back uh, as hard as they can, seeking some form of escape. Um, we, they may even assume that they are not worthy of any affection and therefore not worthy of being loved. The problem and what is ultimately presented in the parable of the lost sons, um, you may know it as the parable of the prodigal son, is that both of these methods are an incorrect understanding of God's love for us. I mean, the Pharisee or the elder believes that they need to earn the father's love or earn the parent's love, but they do not realize that the parent's love, the father's love, is already theirs even before the foundations of the world. The sinner or the younger believes that they are unworthy of the father's love, only not to understand that God loves us ever pursuing us, even though we never deserved it. And so despite the things that we either do or those things that we do not do, or even those things that we um, shouldn't be doing, even though they are shameful and unworthy, we are still accepted because of God's grace, mercy, and love. Now, I think that there are two significant issues that our culture faces in regards to the Father's love, to God's agape, fully connected attachment style love that the Hebrew talks about has said, um, where we are of one mind with the Lord. The first issue is one, we are born into a broken world that can filter how we see who the Lord is and whether we reject him or even if we accept him. Um, the way that we, the, the way in which our lens perceives the world will have an influence on how we see who the Lord is. Um, so some examples of this is, if we look to a earthly parent's love, maybe specifically an earthly father's love, that not one father, no, not one, is, is completely perfect. I mean, ultimately, every father will do the best that they possibly know how, even if they are absent or they are present. But in their fallen and broken nature, that equally can portray... An, in under, uh, an inadequate understanding of a perfect being and therefore cannot adequately display a perfect father. It's, thus, it is very easy to project our understanding of how we've experienced an imperfect love on 
how a perfect agape love should be understood. So, maybe if your father was absent, you may see God's lack of a physical form as a type of absence and therefore believe that he doesn't exist at all. Or equally, if you grew up in a household with high expectations, but you felt like you never lived up to those expectations, you may wonder if you can ever earn the Father's love. And in doing so, you might go either direction of the Pharisee or the sinner. The second problem of the issue or issue that we face in our current culture is this idea of love language. I mean, first, each of us understand love all the better if it is shown through our particular language, that love language that we understand that, that speaks to our souls. Second, another person will communicate very well through their own love language, but they may fail to connect entirely without the, with how the person they are trying to love on perceives that love language. For instance, I grew up in that household that had high expectations. And so even though we, you know, we tried so hard, it was hard to earn my parents, especially my father's love. And then what was more is that my father's love language is giving. And, and the love that was shown in that language was never lost on me. Um, certainly in growing up, we didn't really have an allowance, but when we would go somewhere or do something fun, um, the, the, we were never in want. Um, Dad would, uh, he would carry a chunk of cash in his wallet and just give it out. Um, but at times, though, in terms of, um, I needed words of approval, words of affection um, to speak, you know, to say I'm proud of you, to say I love you, and, and, I, and I miss that. Um, but when we think about how we understand love languages of giving, I, I want to turn to something that I read by John Piper um, when I was kind of researching this topic. He said this about the question of how, how do we know that God loves us? He says, what would it look like if your life to know, uh, what would it look like in your life to know that God loves you? I mean, to know that he really loves you. Would that love be proven in a new job or maybe a better job? Would it be an open door that will allow you greater financial independence? Maybe it would be to find a spouse or maybe deliverance from chronic pain that depletes your energy. Or maybe it would look like being delivered from the consuming demands of a special needs child. What would prove God's love to you? And what if the answer to that question was something altogether different than we expected? That is, if we look to endearing and even objectival, objectively measurable results to determine if someone loves us, um, we, if we only look to that, um, we are going to be misled. Um, because I've said this before, but... I'm someone who learns from my mistakes. And, and not only that, but my dad will tell you that when I was growing up, it was very likely that I would make the same mistakes over and over and over again. Now that I'm older, um, I, I would ha and, and I look at what younger people are doing. And as I mentor a lot of different um, people over the years, especially young men, um, there's some times where it would have been easy to say, and even there was a time where I would say it, I wouldn't do that if I were you, or I would say, I've been there, I've done that, I've learned from that experience, it doesn't work, you should not try it, you shouldn't do that. I would even take some pleasure, um, even if I didn't say it to the person's place, of saying, I told you so, when they would experience hardship or when they would mess up on their own. And yet, my dad will equally tell you that he could do that all day long. He could warn me about what was coming, and he could equally, 
you know, make fun of me <laughs> of saying I told you to. So, I mean, now it may be loving to warn someone, but it wasn't helpful to me. I had to learn by experience. And it also may be um, right and helpful to say I told you so, but it isn't loving. Sometimes the most loving thing you can do is to give a certain thread of grace that a child may explore the great unknown and even experience mistakes, loss, and grief. That does not mean that the parent does not love us. He does love us. And it also means that the parent will never forsake us. I mean, when, I, when I'm allowing my child to learn and to make mistakes, I am never too far behind. I am always close by. And even if they fall, I'm going to help them clean up if they are wounded, if, they, if that experience um, is negative for them. Now, the message of Advent and going into this week of Christmas is to say that the world walking in darkness has seen a great light, which leads us to that verse of God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son, who, and this is you know a theological implication of who would die on our behalf, and those who believe would be saved through Christ. Now, we can glean two things. One, God can use difficult circumstances, even death itself, like he did for Lazarus, to sh show us that he still, in fact, loves us. And again, like Lazarus, he would bring him back from death itself. Second, if we are looking something to measure in regards to does God love us, how can we know that God loves us, we can see the answer in God's one and only son, Jesus. And God did not spare his own son, but gave his son up to die so that those who believe in him would have life and that they would endure God's right justice for our sin, for our continual mistakes. Now, we could take a whole tangent in talking about God's love and justice, both of which are eternally part of his character. I think a lot of Christian theology and Christian history has been influenced by God's love or God's justice, but there are times in history where they are influenced to a uh, the nth degree to a high degree that then takes a pendulum and takes it way out of rhythm. But we have to live in a place where God is both loving and just. That is, a loving parent ought to be just. And a just parent then is far more loving. Yet, if God is both just and loving, which he most surely is, then everything he does is because he ultimately cares and loves his children. That, that means that discipline can be done out of love or to even allow someone to fail is done out of love for ultimately their greater purposes. This is where God can make good of the previous question that we addressed of this notion of does God allow suffering? To say that sin, suffering, and even misery can be used to lead us to the Lord's kindness and love. Thus, we can see suffering from a little bit different light. Um, just because we're going through difficult circumstances, we might say, well, does God really love us? And, and, and we wonder where God is in all of that. Is God present in all of that? The reality is that sometimes... This isn't true all the times, but if you think about the human body and you think about the doctor, you know, tapping your knee and testing your reflexes, or maybe if you were to hit your elbow really hard and hit your funny bone and you feel that, you know, tingling going up your arm, that is a good thing. Um, it, is a, it is necessary that our bodies are able to react to those negative things, that our body would know to adjust and to change course. And so when we face hardship, 
A lot of times I think we need to shift our perspective to say, is there something here that is actually drawing me to God's kindness? Or is there something that I'm experiencing that is calling me to rest even more in the gospel that, and, and to have this understanding that I, when I am weak, he is strong, or when I am insufficient, the Lord is completely sufficient. How am I being called to even walk through difficult circumstances, but then to experience God's love and just character all at the same time, and then to know that even if we never get on the other side of these difficult circumstances, that God has ultimately delivered us from death itself through his son, Jesus Christ. Um, and so I think that whatever we face in this world, it can create a natural reaction, ever wondering if there isn't something more to this life, and ultimately, if we are willing to allow the Spirit to lead, we would be led to know God's love even in those places where we might wonder if God loves us. As I'm sitting here, I'm um, reminded of a David Crowder song of saying, yes, he loves us. Uh, God truly loves us. Um, we can know without a shadow of a doubt based off of all of scripture, based off of our interactions, if we truly are know who the Lord is, but also, and, mo and most of all, we can know that through his son, that we will come to worship as a baby boy this Christmas. Um, as we go into this uh, last week of Advent, um, I'd love to invite you to join us on Christmas Eve at a 4 p.m our Christmas worship service. Uh, that's the only service we're going to have for Christmas. Um, we will not be meeting on Christmas morning. And our hope is that we are able to engage the community well. But I want to remind you that as I do this devotion and then later this week on Christmas morning, we're going to release another video devotion. I want you to think about how worship is looking in your own household. Um, certainly we will come to open presents and uh, it would be very easy to celebrate a commercial-based holiday. But I hope that what we've done here, um, I mean, we've been celebrating Christmas a lot already with the evening in December and with the Christmas pageant, the children's pageant, and now again this weekend we'll be uh, getting together for our Christmas worship on Christmas Eve at 4 p.m. But as we move to Christmas morning, I wonder if there isn't a time to rest, a time to um, reflect on just how amazing it is that God would become human. I pray that you're able to do that this season. I love you guys. I'll just say Merry Christmas a little bit early, and uh, we'll, we'll keep coming out with videos. But uh, if I don't see you, Happy New Year. God bless.